Okay, so good morning and welcome everybody to BC 209, our course on holiness. Thank you for joining the class today. Uh, we will pray and get started. Could, uh, could somebody please lead us in prayer, lead the class in prayer, and then we will start. Anybody could... Uh, Can I pray, Pastor? Please go ahead. Precious Father, we thank you and praise you, Father God. We pray that, Father, Lord, Master, open our heart to receive your grace and love, oh, Father mm -hmm. God. We pray that, Father, consume us in your love, consume us in your grace, so that, Father, we should be able to walk in the revelation of holiness, oh, Father. We pray that, Father, whatever we are going to receive that, Father, these, these words should be treasure in our heart, O oh God, Master. Let it deeply rooted in us so that, Father, we can be able to walk a life which is worthy to you, Father. We pray that, Father, strengthen your servant, anoint his tongue. Every word what is going to Lord Master going to be released from his tongue, O oh Father. Let it pierce our heart and edify our soul and spirit, O oh Father God. And let it cleanse us, O oh Father God. Let we able to, Lord, more, let me be able to, Lord, know about you more and more. Thank you once again, Father God, for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Shrikumar. And good morning, everyone. Welcome once again. Um, so this um, course of holiness, um, I just realized after Monday's class that there's one more chapter in uh, this book on uh, holiness actually it's a very important chapter uh, so i uh, we will finish that today and then monday um coming monday week we will talk about repentance recovery and restoration so it's it's kind of a short uh, lesson uh, but i want to talk about the that is next week uh, we want to talk about the importance of repentance in the life of the believer, how important it is uh, both for us to walk in faith and also to, for us to experience the kingdom. Uh, uh, so we will talk about that next week and just understand the process of repentance and how that actually brings us, brings recovery and restoration in our lives. Uh, so yeah, we'll get, in, get into that next week. And once we finish that, then we will get into a section on overcoming. How do we overcome the world? Or how do you overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil? Because you remember on Monday we saw these are the three things, main things that pull us down as believers. You know, God has done a wonderful work in our lives. He's a holy God. Uh, he's called us to a place of uh, holiness. He has sanctified us for himself. Uh, he has clothed us, us with his righteousness. He has put us in this place um, uh, of holiness before him. And yet because we are living in this world and there is sin around us, these three things, flesh, the world, and the devil, they try to pull us down. And so for a believer to walk in holiness, we have to learn how to overcome the flesh, the world, the devil. Right? So that's going to be the last section of this course, which is the practical side. Right? So now we're going to finish up um, this lesson, um, the chapter 6 in this section on holiness. It's a very beautiful chapter. And uh, so I didn't want to miss it. Chapter six, in the beauty of holiness. So we, just to quickly review, we began this whole section on holiness by saying that God is absolutely holy. Holiness is that one attribute that is being worshiped in the throne room of God. The angelic beings are saying all the time, holy, holy, holy. This holiness of God undergirds every other facet of his being. He will never say or do anything that contradicts his holiness. Even his love and his goodness 
is released in the context of holiness. It never happens outside of holiness. Uh, we also said that his holiness adorns everything that belongs to him. His holiness adorns his house, everything. That means everything that is God, of God or godly is holy. And then we see that, or we learned that God is our sanctifier. He's the one who makes us holy. So he is holy. He wants his holiness to be reproduced in us and revealed through us. And he comes to do the work in our lives. So he is Jehovah Mekadesh, the Lord who makes us holy or the Lord our sanctifier. So he sanctifies us. And we saw that this sanctification work comes in our lives uh, through the cross, through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through God's divine discipline in our lives, and of course, through the people he places around us. You know, he works that discipline. So God is working that holiness in our lives. But we also learned that we have our responsibility. That means we need to cooperate with God to see his holiness reproduced in us so that it can be revealed in us. So that's kind of the essence of this first five chapters. Of course, there's a lot more, but uh, some of the key points from these first five chapters uh, that we've covered. This is the last chapter in this section where we're talking about the beauty of holiness and just some aspects of it. Uh, as, as revealed, especially in the Old Testament. Um, and we have mentioned this before, that um, there are different metaphors that are used in the Bible uh, to talk about the attributes of God. So when you talk about the hand of the Lord, you're talking about his strength and power. You talk about the eyes of the Lord, you're talking about his omniscience. You talk about the ear of the Lord, you're talking about his compassion to hear our prayer. When you talk about the face of the Lord, you're talking about his presence and how he looks towards us. When you talk about the feet of the Lord, you're talking about his place where he dwells or his place of dominion. You talk about the mind of the Lord, you're talking about his thoughts, his wisdom, his uh, understanding. And similarly, when you talk about the beauty of the Lord, we're talking about the holiness of God. So in scripture, these different metaphors about various attributes of God, it is so interesting that the beauty of the Lord is used to refer to the holiness of God. Right? And so we said that, therefore, the holiness of God should, uh, you know, uh, attract us to him. You know, it's his, it's his, it's his beauty, uh, his glory, his splendor. And so in relation to the beauty, of holiness, what, is this, what do the scriptures unveil to us? That's what we're going to do in this chapter. We learn that God's beauty, you know, when, when, that God's beauty can be revealed through us. Uh, the holiness of God, or the beauty of God can be revealed through us. Very interesting prayer in Psalm 90, verses 16 and 17. Uh, and and you know, some of these Psalms are written in uh, uh, almost like you know, couplets, meaning you know, two sentences would, which would actually be saying the same thing in a different way, right? So here he says, let your work appear to your servants and your glory to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So it says, let your glory appear to your uh, your children, to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. And these two Hebrew words are interesting. When it talks here in this case, when it talks about the glory, it's talking about just the greatness of God. Let your your, your glory, your excellency, your greatness. Let it be seen, let your children see it. And then he also is praying 
let the beauty be upon us. And the beauty here, yeah, that Hebrew word beauty here means uh, what uh, what hits the eye of the beholder. You know, how what, what the person, what somebody else sees. So the glory is what the person has, what someone has. Here the beauty is what somebody else sees. And so he's saying, God, let your glory be revealed to your children and then let others see this beauty upon your people. Right? So it's, it's such an interesting thought. God, your glory, let it be on us and let others see this beauty in us or through us. And it is also through the work of our hands, through what we do, you know, uh, you know let people see it. Let people see um, uh, your work and your glory revealed through us, right? So what we are saying, and because we know that the, the ho holiness of God is the beauty of God, we could say this, and this is only in part, it's not complete, but in part, we could say that when we are walking in holiness, it's the beauty of God upon us that's being revealed through us. Others can see the beauty of our God as we walk in holiness. So uh, holiness in our lives, and so that's the statement you're making, uh, holiness in our lives will cause God's beauty, God's work, God's glory to be expressed through us. Right? Because holiness is the beauty of God. I mean, he prays, Lord, let your beauty, in part, he's also saying that the holiness of God be seen through our lives. And so that should be our desire. Lord, let your work, let your glory, let your beauty be seen through my life. Let your work, let your glory, and let your holiness be seen through my life. Another aspect of the beauty of holiness is the Bible tells us to worship in the beauty of holiness. So here, um, when it's used the word, it's the same Hebrew word, Hadar, which talks about the greatness. In the beauty of holiness, you worship God. Right? So true worship, and we said this earlier, true worship takes place in the beauty of holiness. So, I need to be in that place of holiness. And in that place of holiness, I need to worship God. Now, of course, we're not talking about holiness that we have achieved on our own, because we have said earlier that holiness is God's nature imparted to us, and it is God working his nature in us. So we are not coming to him apart from the holiness he's given to us. We are coming to him with the holiness he's given to us. But the point we want to emphasize is, the Bible is telling us to worship in the splendor of his holiness or in the excellence, in the glory of His Holiness. Worship the Lord in the glory, in the splendor of His Holiness. So there is this, this sense of uh, reverence uh, and that's, that's, that's happening in this, in worship. And um, we shouldn't forget that. And sometimes um, in this whole worship that we do or worship that we bring, um, of course, you know, we tend to look for how did I feel when I worshiped God? Well, um, 
it's good to feel the presence of God. It's good to desire to feel the presence of God. I'm not against it. Um, and I know how wonderful it is when you can sense or feel or recognize the presence of God. But sometimes that whole thing can become a very fleshly sense ruled experience. Whereas the Bible is telling us to worship in the beauty of holiness. That means I'm not coming to worship God so that I can feel good and but I come to worship God in that place of holiness saying, God, I'm here. I'm stepping into this place of sacredness, into this place of your glory to worship you. And we leave aside everything else. To worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We should be in the place of awe, of reverence, uh, as we stand to worship him. And not only are we standing in that place of holiness, but worship itself is an adoration of His holiness. You know, here it says, Second Chronicles twenty twenty one, you praise the beauty of holiness. That means you are magnifying, you are adoring, you are speaking of praises, telling off. It is to express the worth. That's what praise is. So you're, you're declaring the splendor, the glory of holiness. Right? Or the psalmist put it this way, that I, I will be to behold the beauty of the Lord. That means you're gazing upon the beauty, the splendor, the grace of the Lord. And we saw earlier uh, the beauty of the Lord. It's His holiness. So the in worship, we are declaring how great, how wonderful His Holiness is. It's focusing in on that. It's our adoration and our admiration of uh, His beauty and His beauty alone, and that in part includes His Holiness. Okay, so worship must take place in holiness, and worship itself is an adoration of His Holiness. It's a praise, it's a declaration of the magnificence of His Holiness or the glory of His Holiness, how amazing and how splendor, how, how wonderful His Holiness is. And then what we also see in the context of worship is In all of these three passages in Psalm 15, Psalm 24, and Psalm 65, it's telling us that God is dwelling in holiness. It says His holy hill, His holy place, His holy temple. And then it's telling us, look, when we come into, when we are approaching the dwelling place of God, which is holy, we need to come putting us like getting us or cleansing ourselves of all of the the you know all the things that are unholy basically so in my approach to god i must come with a holy life and right? so a holy life is important even in our worship of god you know so what i suppose i'm spending 30 minutes in worship. The remaining 23 and a half hours of the day are also important, are also part of my worship, a part of that 30 minute of worship. Because everything else he talks about here in verses two to five, is talking about what we do in the remaining 23 and a half hours. You know, you walk uprightly, you speak the truth, you don't backbite, you don't do evil, uh, all of that. For what purpose? That I may abide in his tabernacle, that I may dwell in his holy hill. So that's dwelling in the presence of God. 
But in order to do that, hey, he's saying, have a life. Our whole life is to be an expression of that holiness. So the same thing in Psalm 24. You know, he says, who's going to come up to the hill of the Lord? Well, clean hands, pure heart, not given to idolatry, not speaking lies, meaning the life I live is a life of holiness in order to ascend the hill of the Lord and to stand in his holy place. Now, again, we don't, we don't want to you know, come under condemnation, neither are we trying to say that we are earning our place in the presence of God. That's not the point. We are coming freely by grace. We are coming freely through the blood of Jesus Christ. But both the Testaments, the Old and the New, are emphasizing a life of holiness, which is then going to facilitate that place of worship in the presence of God. So while we are not talking or emphasizing works, we must understand the importance of a life of holiness in order to you know, be in that place where we can worship and uh, you know, dwell in his holy hill. So our approach to God, our approach to the presence of God takes place in reverence and not in revelry. So this is something um, I feel you just need to point out that somehow, you know, we, we don't hear so much about holiness, in, at least in, in the, uh, you know, maybe the spirit filled settings, maybe we don't hear enough uh, in the contemporary or the postmodern church, uh, or, you know, uh, it, we use different terms, we call them reformed or postmodern or whatever, in the contemporary church. We don't hear enough of this that, look, I, I need to approach God with a life of holiness and uh, the worship must take place in holiness. Worship is adoration of his holiness and a life of holiness provides me that entrance into that place of worship. You know, this is, these are some things we... Uh, don't hear enough or we don't see it modeled for us enough. And so uh, it's time for us to, you know, remind ourselves and uh, get back to that place of reverence uh, before God. A few more thoughts here uh, in, in this whole aspect of, you know, approaching God and holiness. Uh, it's very interesting that God himself says, that he is the one who dwells in the high and holy place. But the person who is of a contrite and a humble spirit dwells with him in that high and holy place. That means, so what God is saying, if you want to paraphrase this, what God is saying is, um, I live in this place of, holiness and those who walk with humility with brokenness are the ones who are going to dwell with me in this place of holiness I'm just paraphrasing what he's saying here so he's the high and holy one who dwells in this high and holy place but he says those who walk with a broken, humble spirit dwell there with him. So it's important for us to understand, and, and, and this is seen in other places in scripture where God says, you know, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And uh, in, in our approach to God, he says, you know, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. So, there is this place of humility and submission that will enable us to dwell in the holiness of God. Or you could say this way, pride and self-dependence will take us away from the place of holiness, from dwelling in holiness. 
If humility and submission takes us into holiness, then the opposite is also true. Pride and self-dependence will take us away from the place of holiness. So, this is an interesting thought that as believers, we have to walk with both confidence and brokenness. We have to walk with authority and humility. So, you know, we know we need to know when I walk in my identity in Christ and in authority, and when I have to walk in humility. We need to know when I walk with confidence in God, I can do all things through Christ. And we need to know when we are broken before God and say, God, without you, I am nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. Because we learn that humility and brokenness enables us to dwell in holiness or pride and self-dependence takes us away from the place of holiness. So we need that. We have to walk in brokenness and humility if we want to dwell in the high and holy place with God. So that's, that's, that's important. And we need to know how to do that. Another interesting thing we see in relation to the beauty of holiness, and this are the last two points here have to do with the millennial reign of Christ. Uh, these scriptures are talking about when the Lord Jesus sets up his kingdom. Psalm 110, verse 103, we know it because the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So this is the, the millennial reign uh, because this, this Psalm 110, uh, verses 1 and 2 are quoted many times in relation to uh, the millennial reign of Christ. So we know that the Psalm uh, is talking about that. It's a prophetic Psalm talking about the reign of Christ on the earth. And verse 3 is interesting because it says that during his millennial reign, his people will be volunteers in the day of your power. That is, when he's ruling, we will be just volunteering, we'll be all ready. But what kind of volunteers would we be? It says, in the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. So, uh, the, the people... Your people will be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of the youth. And if you look at you know other translations and how they have translated this verse, many of these translations, you know, when you read verse three, sometimes it's a little confusing. You're like, whom is he talking about? Is he talking about the Lord? Is he talking about the volunteers? And your people will be volunteers in the day of your power, in the beauty of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of youth. So uh, if you just kind of you know you look into other uh, other translations, it kind of throws some light here. So what it's telling us is that your, your people will be volunteers in the day of your power. They will be clothed in holiness, rising up early in the morning uh, with the strength of their youth. Okay, that's the idea, or at least one of the ideas that are brought out in verse 3. And, and I, I do admit that verse 3 is a little bit confusing. Uh, so usually when, when some verse is not very clear, I just kind of read it in many different translations to see how they have translated it, and maybe that will help understand it. So um, what is interesting is in that millennial reign, the people of God will be volunteers, and they will be clothed with the beauty of holiness. And I, I found that very interesting. You know, that God's people will be clothed in the beauty of holiness. And of course, they will rise up early and they will serve with the strength of their youth, meaning with all their strength, they will serve. Uh, of course, this is also, you know, uh, explained for us in the New Testament that we will reign with him. But his people who are going to be reigning with him, who are going to be uh, using their strength and their zeal to serve with the Lord, what is very interesting is they're going to be clothed with holiness. They're going to be wearing garments of holiness. 
So I was just thinking about that. And uh, of course, he's talking about the millennial reign, but how about today? Christ is uh, ruling in our lives or in us as, as his church. He's our king. And if the millennial reign is going to look like that, then how about today? What should we be clothed with as his volunteers, as people who are serving him? The answer is quite obvious. We should also be clothed with the beauty of holiness. So holiness becomes our adorning as his uh, people, as his uh, volunteers, as his you know, people who are just full of zeal for the Lord to serve him. Uh, uh, so that's that's what I've shared here. And uh, um, John brings out, about Titus and John, bring out the fact that uh, as we look for the glorious appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do we do? We deny ungodliness. We live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Or... Uh, we purify ourselves even as he is pure. So with that anticipation of his return, we choose to walk in holiness and purity. And lastly, when Isaiah writes about uh, the reign of the Lord, uh, he says, there's, you know, when, when Jesus sets up his kingdom here on earth, he talks about a highway of holiness leading in to um, to Jerusalem, and that people will come singing uh, uh, to Zion on on this highway of holiness. So just imagine, even the road leading into Jerusalem, into Mount Zion, in that millennial reign, is going to be called the highway of holiness. Or holiness is going to be the path that brings the nations in uh, to worship the Lord. And Zechariah also points this out. He says, and Zechariah 14, of course, is again talking about that millennial reign. And he's saying, you know, in that reign, holiness to the Lord is going to be engraved on the bells of horses, the pots in the Lord's house, the bowls, every pot in Jerusalem. Judah will be holiness to the Lord. Uh, of hosts and everyone who comes you know and cooks there basically he's saying um, uh, 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 the idea that the truth is bringing out is when Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem everything is, is going to be consecrated to him it's going to be holiness to the Lord even the bells that horses wear are going to have holiness to the Lord the cooking pots are going to have holiness to the Lord you know I just started to imagine that it means everything in and around Jerusalem is going to be consecrated. It's going to be holy to the Lord in the house of the Lord. So um, the, the millennial reign is going to be characterized by holiness. There's going to be a highway of holiness to the Lord. His people, volunteers, will be clothed in holiness. Uh, everything uh, that's in Jerusalem uh, that's that's used for the Lord is going to be, you know, holiness to the Lord. And that's how it's going to end. I mean, the millennial reign, or what we know. So uh, with that, we close off this section. Um, and the main thing, you know, uh, in this chapter, chapter six is that in understanding the holiness of God, we say, look, the holiness of God so so fill our lives that everything we do is done in the context of holiness, being set apart, consecrated to the Lord and for his purpose. Okay. So I will pause here. If there are any discussions we can have, discuss. And um, then next week, we will start talking about uh, repentance, recovery, and restoration. And from there, we go into overcoming the flesh, the world, and the devil. This That's more of the practical side of holiness as it is worked out in our lives. None of us are perfect. 
God is working His holiness in us, but our goal is to get a revelation, an increasing revelation of the holiness of God and how God wants us to live in holiness, whether it's in the worship or in the adoration, in approaching His presence. So we need to understand that and, and let Him work holiness in our lives. Any thoughts, any questions um, on chapter 6? Okay, go ahead, please, Divya. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Uh, my question is about how when you said like approaching God in the beauty of holiness. Uh, so is it uh, the, you know, the kind of the level of transparency you have with God, with your life, and also um, uh, um, you're aware of a holy God, but you know that uh, we know that we are imperfect before this holy God. Uh, so, you know, uh, that rev uh, the understanding of it and being transparent uh, to God about it. Because uh, when you said, like, we approach God with holiness, I didn't quite get it. What, what actually uh, uh, does it mean in a practical mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so practically, good question. So practically, what does it mean? How do we, you know, how do we do it in practice? Well, there is freedom, but there is reverence. So when we come before God, we are free. We are his sons and daughters. Um, we come, you know, through the righteousness of Christ. We come through the blood of Christ. So there's this freedom. There's no sense of condemnation guilt and shame and condemnation and we don't have to say oh god i'm such a wiggly worm or you know i'm such a no good thing you know, we don't have to put up a false pretense we embrace what he's done for us in christ but at the same time there is reverence there is that recognition that he is so big and we are mortal there's reverence for god we can't forget that and we shouldn't forget it. So there is freedom, there is reverence. And then there is also the, the like, like you used the right word, transparency or, or, you know, the desire to be clean before God. You know, there is no pretense and there is, um, uh, I'll use the word purity because Jesus, you know, he said, blessed are the pure in heart, but they will see God. So my revelation of God, my encounter of God is affected by the purity of my heart. That means if I try to keep falsehood or pretense in my heart, it's going to, going to blind me towards God because blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If I want to see God, I have to maintain a pure heart. Or if I want to have a revelation of God, I have to maintain a pure heart. Pure heart means I keep my heart clean before God. I'm not hiding anything. I'm not pretending. God, this is the way it is. And sometimes, it means I just tell, you know, I say, God, you know, I, I got angry about this, or God, I didn't do this right, or God, here's how I'm feeling about this, right? So I don't pretend that it's not there. That would be falsehood. But I acknowledge, God, this is how I'm feeling about this matter. I need you to help me. I need you to get this right in my heart. I know the way I'm feeling is not right, but I need to get it right with your help. So that openness, that purity of heart, which if we maintain, will enable us to know him. Right? So that's another important part in us coming to God. 
purity of heart. And um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Pastor. And one, oh, can I ask one more question? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I was also thinking about when God does, uh, you know, mighty things in our life, and if we are not intentional about acknowledging it. Uh, uh, so that is a way that we are robbing God of, of his glory, right? So um, uh, is, is it right in saying that, like, if I'm not, um, not only in my, you know, heart, but if uh, even before people, uh, so am I robbing God of the glory? So, I, um, the way I would respond to that question is, um, e each one should do what we feel released in our hearts to do. Because sometimes God will do great things, but you don't feel released in your heart yet to talk about it because maybe and I'm just saying it even from my own experience, that sometimes I don't like to talk about it because either it may come out as very self-serving. You know, God has done wonderful things, but if I start talking about it in front of people, it may, it may come out as though I'm using that to serve myself, you know, self-serving. Or it just may be you know, the right time to talk about it. It may be people not ready to receive it. So then... You just keep quiet about it. And when you feel released in your heart to talk about it, then you talk about it. You know, so yes, we want to give God the glory. We want to acknowledge the mighty things we have done. So first and foremost, in your own presence, in your time with God, you say, God, thank you for what you've done. I praise you, God. I acknowledge the good things you've done in my life. I acknowledge the mighty things. So there itself, you're giving praise to God. But when you feel released, then you speak about it to people. Simply because sometimes, it is true God has done great things, but sometimes when we talk about that in public, it just may come across wrong in one or more ways, in the sense that it may end up drawing attention to ourselves than to God. Or people are not ready to receive it, they just will not be able to understand. Other people may be drawn to us since we're being drawn to God, so on and so forth. So I would say, you know, when you're released in your heart to do it, then do it in public. But definitely in your private time of worship, you're definitely giving thanks to God and acknowledging the many things he has done or is doing in your life. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Okay. All right. Um, just a few more questions here on the chat. Uh, Anita's asking, what is it to come to God in brokenness? Uh, brokenness, uh, I, I would put, put, put it in another term. I would call it in dependence towards God, right? So try to imagine something. When something is broken, it has nothing of its own self to hold it up. It needs something from outside to hold it together. So... When we say we are broken, what we are saying is, God, I am dependent on you to hold, you know, in my life. So if you want to say brokenness, if you want to put it in another way, you could say it's a place of dependence or complete dependence on the Lord. That's a sign of brokenness. The opposite is self-dependence or self-reliance. Uh, so if you want to look at scripture in John 15, Jesus said, you know, you abide in me and I abide in you because without me, you can do nothing. So that's a place of broken God. I'm dependent on you. Or when you look at Paul, the apostle, you know, in Philippians 3, verse 3, I think he said, uh, we are of the circumcision uh, who serve God in the spirit and have no confidence in the flesh. And then he goes on to list all his qualifications. He says, I'm a Hebrew of a Hebrew and so on and so forth, you know, but he says, I have no confidence in the flesh. So he's serving God, but he's not depending on himself. Yeah. Um, so Chaya, uh, I was just referencing um, in John chapter 15, the verses that I was just referencing right now was John um, chapter 15, 
and I think it's verse number three. Let me just check again. Um, um, the branch goes uh, for that. John 15, four and five. Uh, also, I was referencing Philippians three, um, and I'll give you the exact verse. Philippians chapter three and verse three. And you can also think about 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, where um, Paul says, you know, we, uh, our sufficiency is of God and not of ourselves. Okay. Um, 2 Corinthians 3 5. Okay. Um, Thank you, Pastor. Oh, welcome. Kennedy, what about people using the title of Reverend? Is there in their name example, Reverend Kennedy, what is your take on this? Well, if they want to use it, it's entirely their choice. Um, you know, and it, uh, I guess it, you know, it, it indicates something, uh, at least in, uh, in some, for example, a reverend means uh, he's been officially ordained by some denomination, you know, and uh, uh, in some situations, it becomes important. Example, if you want to go into a hospital to pray for a person, there are some hospitals uh, that need to see that you have this title or you need to have a card that says Reverend so-and-so. That means you are a lic ordained and licensed, licensed and ordained minister, and only then they let you in. So, you know, uh, in some situations, something like this would be useful uh, to have. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't see anything wrong with it as long as, you know, we are not basing our identity in it. You know, I don't care if people call me pastor or Ashish or brother or whatever, you know, it just doesn't matter to me. I, I don't pay attention to it anyway. So if they want to use a title, I, I've never, I didn't put it for myself, but if they want to use it, it's okay. It's, you know, it's up to them. But it, uh, is it scriptural? I'm is sorry? It scriptural? If it's scriptural to use it, it's... Is it scriptural? Yeah. So there is no scripture for or against it, right? Uh, other than Jesus said, you know, don't call any man your father because you're one father in heaven. Uh, it, it's not, um, yeah, it's more of a earthly practice, a practice here on earth, uh, just as a recognition of ordination or licensing by uh, authorized agency, you know, just like uh, example, example, like if you're a doctor, you know, you need to be licensed by a authorized agency. Uh, or if you're practicing something else, if you're a, you know, you're a lifeguard, you need to be licensed by some or agency. So from that perspective, Reverend comes in, okay, this denomination or this organization has um, ordained and licensed this person. So I wouldn't, you know, worry too much about whether it's biblical or not. It's more of a, you know, a practical thing as we have in many other cases. Uh, all I would say is we shouldn't take pride in it. Don't base your identity in it. If you have it, it's good. If you don't have it, it doesn't matter. But spiritually speaking, our ordination comes from God, right? John 15 and verse 16, Jesus said, you haven't chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you. So if you ask for me practically, nobody has no person on earth ordained me. I don't have a reverend, I don't have a license, I don't have an ordination from any denomination. And it doesn't bother me because God has called us and God has ordained us. So that's enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. I just said a lot of things. But... Okay. Okay. okay but if it's debatable, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. It's okay, but it's debatable. Thank yes. You. Yes. It's open to discussion. All right, Anita. Sometimes we don't take self decisions. Then are we unholy? Uh, so. You know, see, the thing, the, the fact is we all make mistakes. We all sin. We all do wrong things. That doesn't make us unholy. It just means God is still working in us. And we need to bring those areas in submission to the Lord, right? It doesn't say like we are bad people. No, 
just means those are areas that we need to bring before God. And we are going to learn how to do that um, so that God can, you know, we can live overcoming lives. Okay. Last question, Prabhakar. How do we know our sacrifice is holy and acceptable before God? Uh, how do we know our sacrifice is holy and acceptable before God? So if we do it, do it the way uh, the scriptures teach us to do it, right? And we, and, and we do it, of course, we're doing it depending on the blood of Christ, what Christ has done for us. We're doing it from standing in the place of grace. That means by grace, we have been justified and made righteous. And then we offer uh, our sacrifice of praise, of worship, the way God tells us to do it then we know that's holy and acceptable to God because it's being done through Christ based on his work and the way God wants us to do it, which is in spirit, in truth, and according to his word. Right? So, so example, when you're going to worship God, say, God, I come to you and I come because you know the blood of Jesus has cleansed me. I come because of your gift of righteousness and I worship you, God. And then you, you worship in sincerity and truth. That is a sacrifice acceptable to God because you're fulfilling, uh, you're following the instructions God has given to us, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, uh, uh, 19 and 20 kind of outline that. It says, you know, we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus and let us come with a pure heart, having our hearts cleansed from an evil conscience. And, you know, we come that way to offer up to God. So we're coming through because of the blood, we're coming without any guilt or shame, and we offer our sacrifices to God. Okay. Okay, our time is up, and uh, we've got to go for a break and then go for the next class. Uh, we'll pause here. Uh, we will uh, uh, pray and dismiss. Could somebody just quickly pray for us? Dismiss us. Can I pray? Go ahead, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for uh, once again giving us this opportunity, Lord, to learn more, uh, Father, Lord, regarding uh, this aspect, Lord, the beauty of your holiness, Father, Lord. Help us, Father, uh, if there is anything, Lord, that needs to change, Lord, how, in how we approach you, Father. We pray that with the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace, uh, Lord, that you give us, Lord, I pray that you enable us, Lord, to approach you in the right ways, Father, Lord, with reverence, with purity, Father, Lord. Uh, to uh, adore you, Lord, uh, to worship you, Lord, in the beauty of your holiness, Father, and help us also, Lord, as we, uh, Lord, uh, spend time in your presence, Father, Lord, may our lives, Lord, glorify you, may our lives reflect your beauty, Father, Lord, we thank you, we praise you for Pastor Ashes, uh, Ashish, Lord, you uh, strengthen him, enable him, and equip him even more uh, for all that you have called him, Father, I pray for all the students over here, Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, the opportunities given lord bless each one father lord and um continue father lord to uh, guide us lord with the holy spirit in jesus precious name we pray amen. amen amen okay thank you everyone thank you for being on the class today uh enjoy the rest of your day the other classes